Welcome back to the Capes and Tights podcast right here on capesandtights.com. I'm your host, Spooky Justin Soderberg. We're here for Horror Week at the podcast and the website capesandtights.com. All things horror this week. We've got interviews. We've got podcasts. We've got top 10, top 20 lists. We've got reviews of comic books, books, graphic novels, all that stuff right here on capesandtights.com. But it was kicking the week off for Horror Week. I welcome back to the podcast professor and author Jeremy Dauber to the podcast to talk horror, all things the genre of horror. Uh, Jeremy is a professor over at Columbia University, teaching literature, teaching language, teaching all that stuff, but also teaches books or courses on comics, as well as the horror, you know, the genre of horror, uh, which he talks about here on this episode. He's also released a book uh, called American Comics, that we talked about back on episode 19. So if you want to learn more about the book, American comics and the history of comics in North America, uh, check that out over at episode 19 and buy it at Amazon or any of your local bookstores, as well as the author of a recent book called Mel Brooks, disobedient Jew. If you're a fan of comedy and you're a fan of Mel Brooks, uh, you check that out to wherever books are sold. But this episode here for horror week is to talk about horror and all things, the genre of horror. So, this is Jeremy Dauber, author and professor on episode number 133 here at the Capes and Tights podcast at capesandtights.com. Like, follow, share, all that stuff on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Blue Sky, as well as rate, review, subscribe, all that stuff over at Apple and Spotify and all your major podcasting platforms. Thank you, everybody. Welcome to Horror Week with Jeremy Dauber. Enjoy. Welcome to the podcast, Jeremy. How are you? Great. It's great to be back. Yeah, absolutely. I said welcome. Welcome back, I should say, right? We just talked about that pre-recording uh, <laughs> that it's been, uh, let's see, what, let's do the math on that. Like episode 19 to 133 is uh, 114 episodes. That sounds good to me, right? 114 yeah, it, episodes ago. Wow. It, it, in, in between there, when we talked, uh, we talked briefly again, um, I should have pulled this up with anybody who's going to, you know, we're going to talk about the American comics is a uh, a book that Jeremy came on and talked about recently, uh, which is available anywhere books are sold, uh, and, and you can grab it there. Excellent book, but listen to episode 19 about us talking about that <laughs> book. Uh, before we get started into horror stuff and stuff like that, how was the how has the two years of been having this on the shelves? Has it been, uh, been a nice reception for you? You know, it really has been. I mean, I think sort of uh, the, the high point for me absolutely had to have been that uh, Neil Gaiman uh, read it and he really liked it and he blurbed the paperback version uh, and I got a chance to meet him uh, at a celebration for Norton who put out the book and he said some nice things so that was a you know lifetime dream unlocked um, but you know from Gaiman to uh, other people perhaps less famous it's been really lovely to hear some school kids um, who have uh, read it in high schools and in colleges and said that they've learned a lot and, and it's just been a lot of fun to get the response. Um, that's awesome. That's so cool. And that's funny because, uh, you know, this started off, I, my buddy uh, Jabron, who owns the local bookstore, uh, Briar Patch, um, was like, oh, my gosh, like when we were first launching this iteration of a podcast uh, back in 2021, I had you on and Douglas Wolk came on and he was oh, like, oh, these like great book of uh, people who are great authors who are writing great books about comics. This is so cool. Uh, and so that was really cool little like beginning to this journey we've been on over here at the podcast. So uh, thank you again for coming on then, but thank you coming on and returning this time. And I hope people pick up American comics is really good uh, a book on the, the history of American comics. So, uh, you know, grab that at your local bookstore, but we're Thanks. here to talk about more things. Horror. I would say. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is not, right. I mean, yeah, I mean, this is not horror, but there's horror comics, but, and we'll get to that later on this week of horror week here at the podcast. We have some horror uh, comic people, coming on as well but we're going to talk a little bit about everything so what so what's your day job you're a professor at columbia is that correct that is my day job yes that's what i do and uh I, you know i teach students here at columbia and i write books those are my two things that i do as okay part of my day job. yes and and so um but you are uh you teach uh more language uh what was what to give us a little synopsis of what you actually do over at columbia <laughs> sure so the way i usually describe myself uh, uh and my job at columbia is that i'm a professor of jewish literature and american studies those are the two things that i really focus on and i mostly focus on literature and culture i'm kind of a cultural historian and a literary critic uh and so you know i'm very interested in 
uh, uh, on the American studies side, uh, really sort of American popular culture. And so I've written books about Jewish comedy, which is, of course, a major part of American culture, but not only that. Mm -hmm. uh, I've written about comic books, as, as you were just saying, uh, and I've become very interested in horror. I've always been interested even as a kid, um, but now with a friend of mine in the English department, we teach a big course uh, at Columbia on the history of horror. Uh, and I decided that one of my next projects would be to write a history of what has scared Americans, basically, from sort of the earliest days uh, until today. Uh, and so in the process of doing that, uh, I've been reading a lot of scary stuff because uh, and I've been watching a lot of scary movies uh, from sort of the beginning on, on forward and teaching about them, too. And, and, and so I said, oh, there's a book in this. Uh, and so that's what I'm working on now. That, that's that's amazing. I, I love that. You know, it's so much. It sounds like you've been able to like some people like go to school to become a pr professor and they get into professorship and they, they teach like, you know, whatever comes along and, you know, whatever. But it sounds like it's so much fun because you get it seems like you have extreme passion for what you both teach and what you both write about. Is that am I right about that? <laughs> You're absolutely. I mean, you know, I've been very lucky that I, I've been able to, you know, uh, be in places that allow me to do this and that, that I've been able to get to a place where I can do this. And so, you know, yesterday I'm teaching a, a seminar on, on, on uh, the American comic book and graphic novel. And I said in the seminar, um, you know, OK, this is a literal sentence that I said yesterday seminar. All right, let's move from Superman to Batman. Right. And, you know, my 12 year old self would have just been you know, and then last, next term, I'm going to say the sentence, okay, now we have to understand something about Stephen King before we go any further, right? And, you know, and that those two things, again, adolescent dreams have been uh, uh, fulfilled, you know, so to speak. Um, I'm not doing exactly the same things I think I would have done with them when I was 12. Yeah, but, uh, exactly. <laughs> but I'm doing them, you know. Uh, we we uh, we were talking about that. Uh, I had uh, Ethan Sachs on, who uh, wrote Star Wars Bounty Hunters, but he also has a book coming out, or had a book come out called uh, A Haunted Girl with His Daughter Naomi. But he had written a book called Co COVID Chronicles. Uh, he's also a journalist, and so um, he was saying that they're actually teaching. They some schools, like his old high school that he went to, bought seventy copies of the COVID Chronicles to teach. Um, something about, I forgot exactly what he said it was, but something about literature, uh, journalistic uh something and it was like one of those things that like they're teaching using comic book related things in schools something that i would like was getting yelled at for having a comic book in school uh let yeah. alone now they're actually having uh courses all the way I mean, you know in college but all the way down to high school and potentially even lower than that using comic books as a teaching medium and it's just crazy to think about nowadays i'm, I'm only 37 but like the fact that when I was in high school, it was like frowned upon to have a comic book in school. A hundred percent. I mean, I often say this when I'm lecturing to public audiences that, you know, I'm I'm older than you are. But uh, when I was getting, you know, if you said, what would heaven have been like? I was like, well, you could go to the public library uh, and you would have comics that you could get, which was just simply not available. Um, and that, you know, you could, as you say, read them in schools and sort of do a project on them or something like that. And now, you know, people are librarians are all in on graphic <laughs> novels yeah. parents are loving graphic novels you know teachers love them. it's just uh a, you know an entirely different ball game certainly from when i was growing up, but as you say even from when you were uh, yeah. a teenager um and you know of course uh you know what is being on offer uh yes. you know books that you, you know is so different a, a, as well we're really in a golden age for the medium uh um without a without a question so it's uh I mean yeah, and it's one of those things that I feel like, you know, talking comic books, like American comics, a history might be volume two, which is what the change in the, what we talked then in 2021 about how things are changing at that moment and how it's like when you write a historical book like this, like you have to it, history keeps going. And so that's one of those things that one of these days there might be a volume two of this book or an updated version, which adds a couple chapters at the end about different things that come out in the way we use comic books in the future. And that's just one of those cool uh, things you know we have we have digital comics now we have web comics we have things in the comic book world is just ever moving um but one of the things that's growing right now in my opinion is is horror comic books i think horror comics as a whole uh is is fascinating uh, i talked about ethan Sachs here his a haunted girl book with his daughter naomi is a book about depression and suicide but it's written in the horror genre because it's a horrific thing and he was just saying that, like, but it also helps because the horror genre is so big right now that it now falls in line with the people who are like, I want a horror book. So not only is this this unique book, but it's like in this genre that people are actually I, I, wanting right now. Right. And I, I think, you know, what you're getting to just is, you know, something that's very interesting to me in talking with my students and in thinking about this for the book that I'm writing, which is the idea of horror as what we could call a mode, you know, a general mm -hmm. way of looking at the universe. Um, and then, 
you know, we could say that sort of, you know, a story of a true life trauma or a true life, right, right could be horrific and it could be written in a way that, right, um, and horror as a particular self-defined genre um, yes. where we say, okay, there's a section of the bookstore or the library or it's got a, you know, card count, those kind of things. Um, and the uneasy kind of blurring that we have between those two things. Um, so, you know, if you look at sort of the history of it in the United States, which is, of course, what I'm doing in this book, you know, you have authors that we think of as sort of our classic canonical authors, Edith Warden or, or Hawthorne, obviously Edgar Allan Poe, but uh, Henry James, all these kind of writers who are writing works that we would now put in that horror section, but they're just saying, no, these are stories that I'm writing. Yeah. I'm writing ghosts or, you know, whatever. Uh, they happen to have a ghost in them or they happen to. Um, but, you know, starting in the 20th century, we've also really created this genre which in some sense is great because it allows for really people to create a community, to recognize one another, to, 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 to develop new and groundbreaking work, but also sometimes uh, closes it off to people who I think would love a lot of this material or some of it in any way, uh, but it would say, oh, well, I don't read that stuff. That mm -hmm. genre is not a genre I'm interested in. So it's that interesting back and forth dynamic uh, uh, that, that, that comes out sort of in the last years, but there's a renaissance in it. There is no question, just amazing yeah, stuff. Absolutely, like yeah. And I, I agree with you in that sense of like, uh, uh, you know, labeling things. You know, like my brother used to play in bands and he used to be like, someone like, what are you this? And he's like, well, we're just a band. And because he didn't want to put a label on it because putting a label on it made it then you know section off people maybe people will fall more in love with you because of it but maybe people won't even listen to you because of it and the same thing goes my buddies who own a convention in the area they did the bangor comic and toy con mm. uh they added a convention in portland maine which was the main comic and toy con and they do so they do one every six months there's one up here in the bangor area and there's one in portland in in in, in um in april mm. well the the last year to, was it like, like a year ago this october they decided to rebrand it to call it weekend of the wicked for that okay. one convention. And okay. they invited five out of the seven kids from the original It movie. Okay, so oh, wow. Seth Green is obviously way too big and too famous to come <laughs> to our little town. And then uh, sadly, uh, I can't remember his name, but the seventh one has passed away. Uh, so they couldn't get to so five out of the seven it kids were here in our town. Wow. They had brought in, in um, what's his name from American Werewolf in London? Oh, I can't remember his name. It's, um, Whatever the actor from American Werewolf in London who played the uh, American Werewolf in London, David Nunn. Uh, David Nunn, uh, and they invited uh, one or two other guests. They had a guy who did uh, a documentary on the It movie. They had the uh, Stephen King, uh, the Stephen King podcast out there. They invited them all coming in this, the home of Stephen King. I live in Bangor, Maine, which is uh, where uh, Stephen sure. King's house is. This is technically Dairy, Maine, like what you see <laughs> in Stephen King lore, and it was a flop. It, oh, it just really? no one. I mean, it was the weirdest thing because you think wow. people live in the back door of these these places that are in these Stephen King novels. Like I guess that it's not called Bangor in his books. It's mostly right. called Derry. Um, but like it's it's still and so what it was, I think it was because it was a horror style convention. And I think uh -huh. what it did was it brought the people in who were in love with horror, but right. then it sectioned off the people who are like i don't care about scary movies or hor horrific movies or right. horrific things and it was one of the and they had a couple other guests that weren't horror that maybe draw on those people and people just avoided it and so then from that point on they're like okay that's it we're not we're not classifying this convention as any specific genre at all it's going to be a pop culture convention and see what happens but yes cordoning those people off or sectioning those people off sometimes can be bad uh and and that, that's exactly what you said back in the day they just made movies <laughs> yeah i, I think a lot of i think there's a lot of truth to that i mean i think you know and 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 so it becomes very interesting because you know you give and you take you know you have as i say you know this this incredibly vibrant and creative and talented horror community um that is producing you know just amazing work and and really interesting and at the same time you know uh you as you say you know people who are not already kind of self-identified might not come yeah. to you know when i was talking with publishers for this uh this book which algonquin books uh is going to publish and i'm very excited about that you know there were some people who like got it you know who were like this is fantastic and then there were other people who were like you know what um it's not about you it's not about your writing it's not about you but, but we just we're not into horror you know and it's it, it was said in a way that you wouldn't say people don't really say about comedy uh, or right. You know what? I'm not into comedy. Right. Nobody nobody puts it in that way. Um, and I think that, you know, my wife is one of these people who says, I don't understand uh, who I love. I should just say. 
Um, well, I love it very much. But it's just like, I don't understand why you would want to be scared. And I yes. get that. I, I do get that. I totally get that. Um, and I also feel like, and this is something with the conference, that you can understand why you say, we, we're both parents, you and I, Justin. We yeah. don't want our kids to be exposed exactly. to something that they're not ready for. You yeah. know, totally get that too. So, but on the other hand, uh, you know, be, fear is an essential part of the human condition. Uh, and it's interesting to uh, take material that kind of works with those fears, puts them out into the light, like, you know, lets you look at them and lets you think about them. I I wasn't a horror. I mean, I was like the starting this week off of this horror week. I wasn't actually a huge horror fan at all. I'll you know you know just full disclaimer. It was two thousand this the fall of two thousand twenty two where I first ever watched Friday the Thirteenth, A Nightmare on oh. Elm Street, Halloween, all those movies. I didn't read many I, I, you know horror novels at all. Like if I was going to read a novel, most of the novel or books that I've written or read over the year past you know five ten years had been. Uh, books like American Comics or um, all, all of the Marvels from Douglas Wogue or autobiographical style or you know biographical style books, books that I'm trying to learn more about a specific person or something. And it was horror comics that really got me saying, this is an amazing, amazing way of telling a story is having this moments of scariness and, and gore and, 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 you know, comics can scare you by flipping a page to jump scare you on the next panel or whatever it may be and then i started reading more horror novels and and, and last summer like i said last fall i started watching halloween and all them and then this fall i'm continuing the same thing where i'm in this mode where like september 1st rolls around and from september 1st all the way to like uh, thanksgiving i'm just like <laughs> it's horror or horror adjacent uh movies uh and so and then same thing with uh, novels i'm reading uh stephen graham jones uh, Indian Lakes uh, trilogy stuff, and, and I'm, you know, I read some uh, some Daniel Krauss recently, um, and so those horror books are just like it's so much fun. But I'm reading it more in a, uh, you know, Jeremy, in, in a, in a way of taking each individual medium of telling a story of horror story and looking at it differently. And so when I watch a horror movie, I watch the entire thing, meaning that I listen for sound effects, I listen mm -hmm. for the music, the acting. The special effects, all that stuff. When I read a book, it's the same thing. How I'm imagining all of that in my head, reading a comic book, all that stuff. Um, it's just there's so much more to it than if I put a comedy on, for example. You're just listening for the jokes. You don't care about the special effects. You don't care about anything else. You're just listening, watching this movie to have it be funny. You literally could not watch it most of the time. Most of the time, you could have it on in the background and just go, oh, that was funny, and keep on going. Um, comedy comics are more subject. I mean, People could take it. It's like a there's so many different avenues of comedy that it doesn't comedy doesn't hit everybody, and so that's kind of hard in that sense. Um, and so, like, long winded <laughs> uh, thing here is, I just feel like each individual uh, medium to tell a horror story has their own individual pluses and minuses, and they're just more to it. And that's just me because I've just fallen in love with horror over the past two years, <laughs> and why I think they're it's better than everything else right now. Um, but I don't know. I, do you see that what I'm saying on that? Like, do you like, I, have any? I, I do. I think you really, you know, have hit the nail on the head here. I mean, I think that you know, uh, just to start with my own on you know, I did not grow up watching horror movies. They, they were too scary. And, and part of that gets to this point that I think you're making, which is that comics and movies, you know, by definition are a visual medium. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are words in both, but, but uh, they're a visual medium. And so that is a kind of presentation that really kind of uh, basically puts it out there. I grew up with horror fiction. I loved yeah. reading, particularly Stephen King, your, your neighbor. Yeah. Uh, I, that was what I read. And, and even though you can argue that sort of what you create in the mind and the abstraction of these words is, is, is somehow scarier than what you see, that wasn't what it was for me. Um, and it's certainly the case, you know, I, uh, to take an example of a slightly older horror comic that I, that I think is very interesting, um, which was Garth Ennis's and Jason Burroughs' Crossed. Um, that was something I remember, uh, it came out around the time when I had my first kids, and I was like, I do not want this in the house. Yes. Right. I, because, you know, with a book, you know, they're, they're not really going to pick it up until they're at least older. And, you know, but, you know, you, you, you pick up and you open to almost any page uh, of some of these comics and you say, ah, right. 
Um, and that gets to a second point, uh, that you think, which is that, um, you know, e e even within these media, though, whether it's comics or it's uh, novels or it's um, certainly movies, you could have different kinds mm -hmm. uh, of visual display. You can have, you know, even now, although I watch some of the, a lot of this for research, I'm not much of a gore hound. It's just yeah. not my thing. It, yeah. It's fine for people who like it. They like it. That's great. It's not just I'm I'm more of a, uh, a suspense, psychological horror kind of guy which maybe makes sense given that my came to it through sort of novels where mm -hmm. it's less uh, visually out there um but that's just uh my particular inclination but it is you know you can do great work which demands and this gets to that last point you're making justin total attention um you know from either of these right from the, yeah. the total effect uh that they that, 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 that they bring about um and i do think that uh you know a great work whether it's of comedy or of horror you know if it's a work that as you say you know you cannot sort of not pay attention to it then it's just not doing the, it, it, as that's good charming. a job as other ones right um and i think that's you know but but the final thing between comedy and horror and these are as you're implying two things that i love both working on comedy and horror yeah. or both um is that they really do demand a relationship with the audience right, right. if you write a poem and the audience says you know what i don't get that poem you can say well that's not your problem i'm the poet i've uh, you know. but if you say i uh made a horror movie uh and no one finds it scary in any way you know you got to be rethinking your life choices yes, exactly. right. it's exactly uh, um, yeah. <laughs> well if, if it's a horror movie if it's not a horror movie is not scary is it like a tree falls in the woods because anybody here is it an actual horror <laughs> movie or just like i mean a exactly. movie? <laughs> And, you know, I think that sometimes, you know, it, it would be wrong, I mean, as a critic, right, to say, yeah. oh, here's the psychological horror movie. Why isn't there gore in it? Right. That yeah. would, or this, and, and usually it's the opposite way where, and, and I, I, I do not feel this way, but I've read some critics who say, well, this movie is just gore. Um, it can't yeah. be a good movie. And I think that's wrong. I think you can have a movie that is a, that is a really, you know, a splatter movie. Um, and, and, and that can work very well in the same way that you can also have very gory, uh, uh, works on the page, splatterpunk yes. stuff that can be excellent. So, yes. uh, but you you have to judge it by those criteria. You can't say you know the opposite. Why is, why is there no psychology? Why is this not just suspense or whatever? Are you are you watching more movies right now than reading, or or, or are you equally doing both? Because you have read a lot of horror already, and the movies you're trying to catch up on, or like is there or is there just a balance of both for research for this movie, this book? And you movie? Know, I'm trying to do uh, both, and I, I started out in this very sort of strange thing, which was, which I think you know, just but but mm -hmm. the podcast your listeners don't, um, which is that I said, you know what, I'm going to watch a bunch of movies for this, and I've decided because as a historian that it'll be useful to watch them in chronological order, and so I'm going to go on chronological, uh, I'm going to watch them, and I'm going to kind of live tweet through it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this was a long time ago before Musk had bought Twitter and what have you, um, so it was Twitter then and not X, um, and I. Um, said, okay, you know what, I'll probably have to watch like 150 movies. And now mm -hmm. I'm on something like 350. <laughs> uh, and I'm only up to 1974 or something yeah. like that. So uh, I got a ways to go. But I do feel like uh, it's been very interesting to watch this evolutionary development in a way that, you know, very few people on the planet um, have have done now because they they weren't watching them chronologically as of 1970. They'd have to be, you know, in their 90s or 100. Yeah. Now. So, um, so that's been interesting, but it means that I'm very good on stuff up to the mid seventies at this point. And then after that, I get a little bit more shaky. Yes. And, and, and I feel like there's a difference. I think back, I mean, I mean, one of my favorite uh, horror movies of all time are, are psycho. And then uh, also on there, honestly, we're going to release during this week as post is my favorite horror movies. And, and up there is, uh, is Rosemary's baby. And, and it's funny though. Cause like my top five or 10 are all 1980s and below, like earlier uh for my favorite actual like horror movies and then like the 10 to 20 of the ones that are like within the past five years and right. it's just kind of funny that or for most of them, i would say there's a mixture of everything in there but like 2022 for me for, had a bunch of really good horror movies that came out that i was really excited about but it's still one of those things that like uh, if you want to say what's some good horror movies i'm probably gonna go to the 1970s 1980s and tell you that's where horror movies were good because i feel like also they changed a little bit i think we're going back i think to the classics in the sense of some people are writing more current horror movies that are based like they could be written in the 1970s but yeah. there was a while there where they just wanted to freak people out and gross people out in horror movies and i just didn't understand like even the amityville horror 
mm-hmm. from what 1979, uh, right around there, to the 2005 version or 2009 version of it with Ryan Reynolds in it, like the two, and then 1979 one where it was like. You had to rely on acting. You had to rely on practical effects. You had to rely on most of that stuff. It was way better, I think, than the new one because the new one was like almost like they were just trying to gross me out and like just trying to make me not be able to watch the screen, whether it be jump scares or thing. There was more story in the 1979 version that was just scary, and I think that's what I think. Of. I think you're up to the point now in horror movies where like you've watched some good ones, whereas now yeah. from this point on, you have to like struggle through some of these movies that you're going to watch if you end up watching a lot more. <laughs> well, I also think, you know, one of the things that's interesting is, you know, when you watch two movies from 1975, let's say, yeah. and one of them is Jaws, you're like, this 1975 is a great year for horror movies. Yeah. You watch, like I just did, 45 movies from 1975 that are horror yeah. movies, you, write, you know, there are a lot of stinkers yeah. there, too. Yes, I mean, you know, and, and, you know, you can learn interesting from a cultural historian's perspective. Yeah. You can learn a lot of interesting things from those. But, you know, a lot of them are, 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 are not very good. But we... we as we should, because if, if you're normal human beings and not writing a book about this, um, you cull in your head yes. you know, all away. So, you know, 1974, you see Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That's something that we're right where, you know, this is not a movie that uh, shies away from anything. And it no. still goes hard, you know, the, the original uh, many, many years later. Um, but what it does, which I think is one of the many things that it does is very good, is it really takes a fe- it takes account of the impact that this violence would have on a random person who stumbles into it. So the, the main character, the main protagonist, the final girl is, as yeah, they're often yeah, yeah. right, spends a lot of the last 15 or 20 minutes just screaming her head off, like panicking. Her. And you're like, of course, like, what would you do if you were a normal human being? And this, you would just like go stark raving mad right away and just scream and go on impulse. And Toby Hooper, you know, does a phenomenal job uh, of, of of portraying that so that works you know very well um jaws which comes out the next year you know thank god the shark broke as they say because uh you know it, it ends up it ends up being a, a work of real sort of suspense mm-hmm. uh, because they don't show the monster and it also and this was interesting about watching it right at this time right is it becomes in some ways a work about sort of post watergate mm-hmm. not trusting uh, the government, right? Mm-hmm. The they're like, oh, we can keep it open; it's all fine, right? When they know, so that becomes a lot of th- those things become a lot of fun. But then there's all these other movies in which you're like, really, this is this is what you're talking about now. Ugh. And it's funny you mentioned Jaws too. It's like it's a horror. It's a it's a movie that I for the longest time I didn't want to put on a horror list. Uh, uh, like for the longest time, I was just like, no, it's not. And I don't know why. I don't know if it's because I didn't have a lot of history and knowledge of, of horror where I'm just like, but then I'm like, no, it does make sense. That and Alien. Uh, a lot of people don't put Alien on a lot of their lists of horror movies, but I'm like, it is a, it's a horror. I think it's a horror movie. It's it's a different type of horror movie, but it's a horror movie. Um, but also Jaws in 1975 was the first really summer blockbuster. And yeah. so you think about it, it's like this first horror movie in this movie that's really uneasy to watch. And it's, it's kind of, it makes you, I mean, how many people didn't swim this summer of 1975, you think? You know what I mean? Like in places that have no sharks for sure, <laughs> we're still not shark swimming. People were like paid to go on ponds and, and pools in 1975. Um, but it was the summer blockbuster. It was the first definition of a summer blockbuster film. And it was in that horror genre, which is pretty crazy because nowadays if a horror movie makes 10 million dollars in the box office they're like oh, oh look at that this is amazing uh when now there's like back in 1970 it was a blockbuster it was a movie that made tons of money and was very popular and still is to this day yeah i mean it gets back to this thing that we were talking about earlier about sort of you know i'm less interested about the blurring between sort of horror as a yeah. mode let's say and horror as a genre um I, I am for this book. I'm, I'm more interested in what scares people than what the genre is. So I have a lot of things uh, in, in in the book, and I, that that one you wouldn't conventionally call a horror movie. Yeah. They, they, so I think that that gets, I think, quite rightly, Justin, to some of your uh, 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 diffidence about putting this in sort of a horror category. Yeah. Right? Everyone understands, and Spielberg does a great job with this, with these shots from kind of underwater coming. Yeah. Up, the fear of being in this sort of uh, murky medium and something where you're not really in control and something grabbing you and sort of taking you out of control, right? It really is about a, um, we're trying to go out there and conquer an environment and the environment is just too hostile for us. And we really kind of know that. And Alien mm-hmm. is the same way, right? Space yeah. is hostile, right? Uh, Alien, you could argue, is kind of Jaws in space. It's really H.P. Lovecraft in space, but kind yeah. of Jaws in space. Yeah. Um, 
And, you know, and then, you know, I mean, I think, and this is something with all sort of the later shark movies, the more you see the shark, the more you're like, eh, that's yeah. not, okay, it's not going to happen. I'm not going to have a gigantic shark go like this. That's it. Yes. All right, I'll jump, but then I'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, but every time we go into the water, we're like, okay, we know it's not going to be a shark, but yeah, what, maybe we'll do something else. Yeah, and something then, in that water is something that's like why, like, you know, yeah. crystal clear water in the like on a shore of a of a Bahama beach where you're like see the water. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> right. But like murky water in a pond, uh, right. you never know what's gonna what what lies beneath kind of thing, uh, and, and, and so on. But what's kind of what's really even scarier about Jaws is the Jaws two when the people who run the town still don't get it. That's the scarier part. Like honestly, it's a horror movie in a sense that there's like, obviously sharks and there, you know, all that stuff. But like the scariest part is the people who run the town are like, no, it's not out there. But, like, dude, we just did this like not long ago, and people died. This is not cool. Why are you listening? That's scary. So I was thinking in my head, like, check about what what scares us in the world. Are you going to get into politics? No I'm kidding, because <laughs> well, that's what's scary in this world right now. I, you know, I think I think that you know one of a hundred percent the book is going to get into politics because uh, you know in that broadest sense of the word, yes. right? Because you know in the nineteen fifties, for example, um, people were afraid of the so American sessions. They were afraid of the Soviet Union. They were afraid of this the the, the Cold War suddenly heating up of this kind of thing. and they were afraid of communist infiltration. You know how meaningful a threat communist infiltration really was we could talk about right but certainly a movie like invasion of the body snatchers mm -hmm. you know it's built on this fear of there's some hostile force and it's a human force even though in the movie it's allegorized as an alien right mm -hmm. that's going to come in and it's going to ruin our way of life and whether you know the actual facts of that are right or not um you know uh, the fear was there uh, and that's something that's uh, very important to me i mean you know to take a different kind of thing you know so much of our domestic agenda now um, is generated by all sorts of fears. Um, and I'll take sort of a simple one. Um, you know, all of these shows on CBS over the last 10 or 15 years are like, there's a predator right, you know, in your neighborhood and, you know, this and that, right. And they're going to drive and they're, you know, and, and, you know, you can say until the cows come home that the statistics are, show that these fears are disproportionately put on these shows. Right. But that doesn't necessarily change our attitudes towards mm -hmm. it. Um, and, and that's very interesting to me um, in terms of the, the you know, the, the fears in question. Um, so. uh, the, uh, we had uh, David Desmalcha and Leah Kilpatrick on in the month of October. Obviously, this is we're recording this early. So I recorded it yesterday, but it doesn't come out <laughs> until the middle of the month. But this is coming out at the end of the month. But so it's always weird when I have this discussion with people where I'm like, this person came on the podcast and it really hasn't even aired yet. Um, and they wrote a short story in a book called A Headless Horseman for Dark Horse Comics. Uh, okay. which is their annual it's like their anthology uh, about like horror stories like little horror snippets and this is little like uh, kid monsters that go into a horror haunted house and the horror rooms that they go into are not your typical like something's gonna jump out at you or whatever it's like a psychiatric office a psychiatry office and there's a <laughs> political one and, all. and it's like it's all these different ones that are like actual fears in the world like <laughs> i am a big person big fan of horror movies of things where you like turn the movie off and go oh my gosh Jeremy, that could actually happen. Like yeah. that's like possible to happen. And that's uh, a legacy of violence. It's a book that Cullen Bunn just put out with uh, Mad Cave Studios. Uh, okay. And I just had it, I read it at my book club with uh, my local comic book shop. And I'm like, the biggest thing I love about this book is the fact that when you close it, there's no supernatural element. There's no alien force. There's no, there's, there's a book is quote unquote believable um, to the point where like you, you close the last page of volume one and you're like, this person in this book could be my neighbor. And that's the scariest thing to me. Forget the fact that Jason has now been around in 17 films and, and the fact that, you know, Michael Myers or somehow can't be killed and all that stuff. Like the original Halloween, when it was just this person to the point where, or original Jason, where it was uh, you know, spoiler for everybody who haven't seen Jason or uh, Friday the 13th, number one is this is mom. Um, was was believable to me when when Jason comes Jason gets resurrected by the lightning bolt uh in his body in in the grave that's where it'd be like, okay now you lost me and that's <laughs> the scariest but like, the scariest thing to me is the fact that I could leave this house and run into someone who is based in this movie who could be killing people that's the scary to me <laughs> and you know I think that w one of the interesting things about that right is that you know in some sense you might be able to argue that those those later movies lost the plot right that they, yes that the 
the the the impetus of Jason right was that he was a believable character, and then they've rendered him unbelievable. Yes, um, I think I was a young adult. I think that's this is the timing is right when Buffy the Vampire Slayer came mm-hmm. out, um, which I loved, and I thought that clearly you know it made no bones about not being real, mm-hmm. uh, but it it did, and I know there's all this stuff with Joss Whedon now, and I yeah. think that's we should mention that, but but the, the the thing that made it very powerful for people in the '90s certainly was the sense that it was such a clear allegory for stuff that meant a lot to people. So like when, you know, she sleeps with Angel for the first yeah. time, and then he becomes a, a, you know, an ass and never calls and never this and that, right? Yes, it's true that the the kind of, the nature of the ass that he becomes is a psychopathic killing vampire, right? But um, really it's all of this thing like, you know, are they only interested in me for one thing? And, mm-hmm. and I felt that that rang very nicely um, because it never made any bones that it was an allegory. Yes. Uh, you know, and, and, and so, you know, if it works in whatever vein it works, but here, like you're saying with the, the Jason thing, you know, you say, well, okay, it was one thing and it was really about sort of this plausible, believable thing, but then it becomes something like, well, no, where is this doing? And you're like, uh, okay, I understand you wanted to make more money and you needed, you know, sequel number nine or whatever. Well, I, I, and I always look at this in the way, in the way that I am not a, a filmmaker and I don't, I, I don't feel like I could be a good filmmaker, but I also, uh, you know, critics at home, you know, couch critics here uh, sitting on the couch watching the movie, like how I could make this better. It was like the simplest answer to the Michael Myers and the Jason thing is, is that they're both wearing masks. So it could literally be anybody underneath it. And so this <laughs> like could be passed down multiple times that like you would have prior to the 13th, number 27 and just have it be, oh my God, he didn't know he had a son or, or you know, all this other stuff that could, could make it more believable in my sense. But no, you kill this guy a bunch of times, you revive him or he gets shot in the head and still survives and all this stuff. And I'm just like, okay, now I'm like, of course it was Jason. Everybody's not, that's the other one where people don't believe it. Oh, he's, right. there's no way it could be Jason. Okay, we're near Crystal Lake and a guy's killing someone it's probably jason people come on how many the 17th <laughs> movie has come out you don't understand it's actually jason uh yeah. but no it, it's it's you're right they lost where they were going with it and and that's the other part is they're che- most horror movies are cheap to make and they they make their money back and so making these movies is to them is like making another reboot of friday the 13th or halloween or something like that like they they finished halloween you telling me right now michael myers is not going to make another appearance in the next 10 15 years Right. Like it could be five years between the, the Michael Myers returns and they reboot the whole franchise again. Right. And uh, it's because they make money and that's, you know, they're going to make movies yeah. that make money. <laughs> and because there was something, you know, yes, a hundred percent. And there was something sufficiently powerful about that original myth yes. that, you know, makes people will say, oh, okay, well, you know, I don't know. Some of these have been better. Some of these have been worse, but yeah. I'm going to come back uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to take a look. You know, I mean, we are both come from a, a medium that we love in which there have been characters who have had been around for 80, 90 yeah. years with thousands of stories, tens of thousands of stories about them. And, you know, and some of them have been amazing and some of them have been, uh, yeah. has been amazing. Um, yeah. And, you know, and yet there's this big thing that, and so that becomes interesting about these monster type yes. characters and these, and these archetypes. Um, and really, you know, someone back in the late seventies and the early eighties, they said, you know, we, we, we've got lightning and not the lightning that reanimates them from the dead, but lightning. Uh, and, and, and we're going to, we're going to work. And I, and I do find that interesting too. I mean, in the 1940s, you know, the 1930s, then into the 1940s, you have like six different Frankenstein movies yeah. and four werewolf movies and all this. And, you know, you can see them sort of actually trying to figure out well, what uh, this is a cash grab, um, but also what does it mean to make the fifth Frankenstein movie? You know, mm-hmm. and this is, uh, um, what can we say, for lack of a better phrase, what can we say that sort of justifies the existence of this mm-hmm. movie? And it becomes interesting. It's an interesting set of questions. It, 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 yeah, it, 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 you're right. It's funny how you mentioned it. You're, you're, you're the smart person over there. I didn't even oh. equate the fact that like I've, well, I've read 17 iterations of Spider-Man and, <laughs> you know, or whoever's died or come back or they waste someone's memory and things like that. I'm like, that's basically an equivalency to the horror side of this where they're just like, well, we've got to keep this character going because people like them. So we'll figure out a way to revive them and, and tell the story or continue telling the story. Uh, and, but that's kind of and it's interesting yeah. to me just to get back to the comic thing for a yeah. second, like where, where you know, for for people of my cohort at least, who's again a little older than you, like the fact that Jean Grey, the fact that Jean Grey came back to life, like you know, people kind of were like, all right, well maybe or whatever. Although that all that still was a big deal when she came. Yes. But when Gwen Stacy came back to, yeah. uh, you know, people were like. 
uh, my, like one of the most meaningful things about the universe was that she was dead. Uh, mm -hmm. And the fact that they they've made this decision in some sense really messes with the warp and warp. You know, it would be like having Frankenstein be like, you know what? I'm perfectly integrated uh, into society. It's it's you know, it seems to betray the essential features of the myth. Um, mm -hmm. And the only way to do it is to play it for comedy, like in the monsters. Um, yeah. You know, you're like, okay, he's a happy family guy, but but yes. we all know this is a joke, right? And yes. so that's well, I mean, that's uh, we've I've had I listened to multiple podcasts about the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the idea that like. People have Tori like, is Tony Stark going to come back? It's like, no, stop. That was a very integral part in the entire storyline of the MCU. And for you to right. bring back Tony Stark from the death or the number of times they brought back Loki and things like that. Like, okay, guys, there was, there was, you had meaningful, purposeful deaths that made an impact in both the viewers and the actual storyline. And you're talking about the idea of like, oh, but he's actually not dead. And I'm like, no, stop. Like you, there's, there's hundreds of other characters you can go and play with. Stop. Tony Stark, we liked it. Robert Downey Jr. was great. He's dead. Let's move on. <laughs> Let's stop rebooting these people. And it'll be interesting to see what happens. I mean, you know, yeah. as we're dealing with these cohorts of, uh, of of 60 years, 80 years, 100 years, something which is so deeply meaningful. I mean, it turns out that I came into the Marvel Universe when it was, even though it seems crazy to me, when it was only about 20, 25 yeah. years old. Uh, and now it's 60 years old. Uh, and so there are people who were, uh, born, uh, you know, they become adults and everything like that, you know, uh, uh, almost you after after I started reading this yeah. and for whom Gwen Stacy, you know, doesn't mean anything, right? So mm -hmm. just some random character who died off the program, you know, 40 years ago or whatever it is. Uh, and so why not bring her back? Well, you don't have that, uh, that you know, and, and so that that also as a cultural historian becomes interesting to me when certain things which have a sacredness to them like you're saying, yeah. uh, when that sacredness sort of wears off, if it ever does. Um, and I don't know. I, I, I've lost – I'm a huge Marvel – I'm a bit of Marvel zombie since I got into comic books. But, like, I've lost a little bit of the love, not fully, like, not uh, done with them altogether. I don't read DC Comics, so that's just – I don't like DC Comics. Um, mm -hmm. But I read Marvel Comics here and there, and, and, and I looked at my poll list for this week, and I have a pretty substantial poll list. I pull about 10 to 14 books a week. And, okay. and uh, this week – I have one, two Marvel Marvel prop. I have a couple Star Wars on there because they're owned by Marvel. But that's there's right. four Marvel comics altogether on the entire list, and there's seven horror comics or horror adjacent comics. And so, like one of those things that I've like thinking to myself, like it's slowly been overtaken about stuff that are these little mini series that come and go. Uh, there's something about the con like even me as a person who's been a Marvel fan for a long time. Sometimes I'm lost on where things are and who's done what and who's alive and who's dead and who's actively in a, a team or whatever. But when you have a five issue mini series, it's a horror mini series that literally comes and goes. I'm like, I can do that. It's five issues. So, and so, but then I like the connected ones, you know what I mean? Like, so like there's all this whole back and forth on it. Um, but horror to me is of overtaken it. And my, my local comic book shop owner was the same thing. Paul Eaton. He's like, dude, you're pulling more Marvel or more horror stuff than you are um, or independent you know, fully uh, than you are Marvel nowadays. And I said, yeah, it's just, I don't know. It's something about it right now that I'm, I'm into it. I don't know if it's like I mentioned at the beginning, the resurgence of the genre of horror and people want that. Uh, if it's just really good stories being told right now in that genre, like, you know what I mean? Like maybe it's one of those, that's what it is. People just who tell good stories have decided to do horror comic books and that's where it's landing. I don't know. I think, I think it's a confluence of a lot of these factors and the fact that you're, growing you know aging yeah, yeah, uh, yes. as we all are at the same rate uh and changing uh too i mean i remember uh because i'm almost precisely uh of this age yeah. that i i went to i was a marvel zombie in elementary school and through high school and then i went to college and and i was like you know i'm tired of sort of some of that stuff a little bit um and that was when vertigo really yeah. dc's vertigo really started coming out and sandman was in the middle of its run and preacher and Hellblazer had switched over to Vertigo. And, you know, and that was this golden age, this golden age of horror, right? Mm -hmm. There are always lots of golden ages, but this was one of these ages. And I was like, I would not have wanted to read this stuff in high school. Um, or, uh, it would not have been what my tastes would have been. I would have been too scared. I would have been not. But in, in graduate school, I said, you know, this was exactly right for me. And uh, I think that, you know, with an audience who's pulling stuff that really are adults, uh, you know, that are able to deal with kind of the maturity and the themes that are in these horror comics, uh, you know, and with the, the just monumental talent that's working in it now, mm. uh, you know, 
and with some exhaustion from you know we when when we were growing up there wasn't so much on tv and movies and everything that you didn't have to uh, also keep track of those universes yes exactly it um, makes it makes it difficult. And like I said, that's that horror. I guess that's the, again that horror thing, which most of them, I am a person like I mentioned. I watched Amity Bill Horror in 1979, and I watched the 2000, the more recent one, 2009, I think it was, to kind of give a. Uh, and I watched them back to back. I watched them like I think one night and then the next night, and those are the kind of like trying to compare. I like connected things in the sense that either the remakes or the same worlds and i think the reason why i love all that is because of marvel i think marvel at the beginning i'm like wait i can read the thor book and then the x-men book i see the different angle of the same battle this is amazing and yeah. rewatch remakes or continuation stories or whatever uh um I, i'm gonna watch the exorcist again and then watch the new exorcist that comes out and you know those kind of things where i'm like i like that connectivity and i thank marvel for that because i think that's what really started me on that um but I do like this one and done thing too, where I'm just like, okay, I get it, I consume it, and I move on from it. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's it's one of those. I guess it is growing up. I'm growing up, Dad. I'm growing up. Uh, my dad just turned sixty years old yesterday, so uh, he's growing up too. <laughs> yeah. Well, happy birthday to him. Uh, I, I bet he's listening. Happy birthday, sir. Yeah. Um, I, I do think also though that you know, and this has always been the case. Um, that we have different pleasures and we take them in different ways from different things. So there's there's a great pleasure in reading a long serialized uh, material or watching it or what have you. And that's one kind of pleasure. And we get that with this part of our brain. And the other part of our brain, we're like, okay, out, you know, in and out. Yes. And we want, we want the story and we want it to be done. And, it's a, and, you know, and again, it gets back to a theme we've been sounding where sometimes you know, like on Netflix or something like that. You're like, this should have been a one seasoner. Yeah. Um, and it's five seasons long. You're like, oh my God, they, they ran out of story. They ran out of theme. Um, you know, even for great, great one season or two season shows. And I think that's true with some of these these stories too. I mean, there's a very interesting, um, uh, I talk about this a little bit in the comics book, uh, introductory essay by Alan Moore, one of the first great modern horror mm -hmm. comics writers, obviously, among other things, um, in his in a Swamp Thing collection that he did back in the 80s. Um, uh, the collection came out in the 80s, uh, as well as the Swamp Thing. And he says, you know, the problem with Swamp Thing, I tried to tell my stories, but is that there's no real end. Yeah. Right? He's like, you know, I could stop, basically, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I could stop, but something that he knew was going to take it over, you know. And so when Neil, you know, uh, took over uh, Sandman, or redid Sandman, recreated Sandman, uh, you know, he basically said, and, and I've confirmed this with my co-teacher, Paul Levitz, who was the president, you know, at the time of DC, he was like, you know, like, this is, when I'm finished, this is going to end. Yeah. And Paul was like, yeah, you know, okay, we get it. Um, and that really started in a, in a very deep way. Uh, this kind of storytelling that we, we that we love so much of being able to say with a comics character, okay, I'm out. But a lot yes. of them you can do that with, you know. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, but so you're so you're researching this book. So this book is hopefully uh, you said hopefully at some point in the near future is going to actually uh, come out. Um, do you? I would like a little know a little bit about the process before we finish this up. Like, are you do you physically write as you're going along? Or are you all the research and then write? You know, then you write your book. Is that how you do it usually? You know, different people have different processes. Definitely, my process is really to write as I go along. Okay. Uh, because uh, you know, one of the th and I find that as a historian, that can be very useful, particularly a cultural historian, because it's not like when in nineteen to take one of our examples in 1975, it's not like Steven Spielberg when he's making Jaws is saying, "I this is going to be an enormous hit. I'm going to create the summer blockbuster as we know it, and I'm going to become, uh, you know, Steven Spielberg." Right. Yeah. It's like, you know, I've had a movie or two. They've done okay. I'm basically a TV movie director with some slightly, with, with high ambitions, but some yeah. slightly higher possibilities of success. Um, you know, this was a very popular novel. I'm going to try and adapt it. We'll see what happens. Um, and so it's it's nice to be in that headspace as well as looking around at like what he's drawing on from right before. Oh, he he's all, he's certainly seen Rosemary's Babies. Not that those yeah. Right, but he's certainly seen Rosemary's yeah. Baby. He hasn't yet seen the Amityville Horror. It hasn't yeah. come out yet. Um, that's useful. So that's really what I try and do. It's a, you know, you can't unknow yes. a lot of the stuff that you do, but you you try as much as possible. And so with a book on Mel Brooks that I wrote uh, 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 recently, yeah. uh, it's the same thing. You know, for most of his career, 
uh, he, he becomes really Mel Brooks uh, already when he's a real adult. He's not he's not an early huge success, uh, and that matters. Uh, having had all those years of not really being successful. So. Yes, and that book is uh, what Mel Brooks, the disobedient Jew. Yes, that's exactly yes. right. So it's a what we call a Jewish biography of. Okay. Mel Brooks, um, but uh, if you're interested in in, in him out there, yeah. uh, including Young Frankenstein, there's our, uh, our yeah. crossword. <laughs> right. um, you know, you should. Uh, there's some fun stuff about that in there uh, as well. That's amazing. Uh, so, so you've been watching 300 and some odd horror movies <laughs> now, and is there is there are you pinpointing ones that in your in your mind and just your life that's like some of your that you've actually like some of your favorites from those 300 movies or are most of them just blending all together at this point <laughs> well a lot of them do blend. i mean i've been taking notes thankfully because otherwise they would yeah. a lot of them yes. blend together but um you know and what's interesting is that because you can't write about all of these in a book yeah. that covers a lot of other ground too um you know the ones that stay in your head you're like oh there's something worthwhile about this so i'll leave uh the podcast if you want justin with one recommendation of one that i think people probably yeah. have not seen or the odds are good that they haven't seen anyway um and it's i think it's very interesting and in its own ways it's quite powerful um it's a movie from the early 60s it comes out a little bit before the kennedy assassination called the sadist so clearly someone saw yes. psycho they were like i'm gonna you know um but the movie is not really about, it's not really a psychological movie in any mm -hmm. way. It's just, that's the title. And it's basically, and this this will sound very familiar to everyone who's listening to the podcast, it's about these um, uh, friends in a car mm -hmm. and they take a wrong turn, right? And they drive off and they run into these two people who basically try and kill them. And what's interesting and very powerful about the movie in 1963, and it's made by... You know, people who have made like terrible horror movies before, right? And, and they never did anything like this again. Mm -hmm. um, is that there is basically no motivation for why they kill some of these people and they attack other people. Um, it's just they and they happen to be turning the wrong way. And and you know, I'd watched up to this point 150, 200 horror movies. There's almost none of them that are like that, right? That where where the there's no. I mean, a lot of times, as we know from our friends in the EC comics there's a disproportionate punishment to a crime, right? Or like Friday the 13th, you know, you could say, you know, the wages of premarital sex are not that you should be stabbed to death, right? Yes. But, but you could say that the movie has that moral code, whether we agree with it or not, yeah. right? Here, there is nothing except that they go the wrong way um, and they suffer for it. And you watch this, and as I say, it comes out a little bit before the Kennedy assassination, at which again, you have this feeling starting around there, that maybe the universe is meaningless. Maybe a random guy like Oswald can, yeah. you know, kill the president. Yep. Uh, so, have you seen the, Have you seen The Strangers? Two thousand nine. Has uh, uh, because Liv, you were Liv Tyler in it. Liv, yes. Yes. <laughs> That's the same. It's yeah. the same idea. It's like why? Why us? It's because you were home. <laughs> yeah. Like oh my god, that's like a hundred percent. And that gets, you know, and, and, and I think the, the sadist is the first version that I've found. I, you never want yeah. to say first because it's yes. always, but the, uh, the version that I've had where, you know, there's that sense of there is no overriding order to the yeah. universe. Yes. It's not even that there's a maleficent overriding order. There's just none. It's just amoral and bad things just happen. Yes. Um, and that's a fear that deep down we all kind of have, yep. um, uh, you know, and, and, and it's put out there uh uh in this movie and 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 i'm not you know i think it's a it's a well put together well shot and from a theme perspective extremely okay. scary movie even i'm gonna add that to my scary. list Rush. i haven't seen it either so i'm gonna add that to my list but in this in this journey of myself so like i said like you've been watching horror movies and reading horror books and doing all this stuff for this for the research for the book i've just been trying to like catch up on the on the horror genre as, as a whole in both novels and in the movies and i've watched a bunch of movies over the past two years that fall in that horror genre or, or adjacent genre um i've also watched way too many movies with unnecessary nudity uh, i realized <laughs> that about the horror genre that there's just one of those things where it's like for some reason um when the killer attacks the person they end up being topless and i don't understand why okay someone's in your house you can't reach for a t-shirt uh <laughs> there's small plot holes that i don't understand i go oh it sells movies because sex sells uh mm -hmm. that's probably but there's these unwritten rules that are in like horror movies where there has to be like certain things that you have to say like oh who's out there oh i'm gonna go look at it you have to have a topless there's like these things that i just realized over watching these movies i'm like I 
my, my buddy Paul and I watched the Man Thing movie from 2005. Okay. Um, we discussed it on the podcast. It's a Marvel movie, uh, but it really has nothing to do with Marvel comics. It's just the character name Man Thing came from the movie. Right. And I'm thinking to myself, it's, it's funny because we laughed because like five minutes into the movie, they're they're on this boat in the swamp and the, the woman's topless. And then the then her boyfriend gets stabbed and the blood goes all over her. And that's like a pointless scene. Like he was fully clothed. Why was she t- like it was this whole thing and it was like Marvel was trying to make a horror movie and they're like, we've got to do this. We gotta put this in the we gotta put this in the movie where we're not gonna be taken seriously. And I just laugh and like sometimes and I go, maybe that goes down to the fear. Whereas if I were at home completely nude and someone I would be more scared being completely nude than I would be if I was closed. <laughs> I mean, I think it's extremely, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I think you're right. I think it's extremely interesting, um, both that vulnerability of being naked, yes. as you said, sort of right, right. Um, and the double standard of, as you say, you know, of, well, uh, the guy could be. <laughs> guy could be know, naked, but why is she? You know, and, right, she? And then also, it's, you know, where, you know, again, I said, I'm to the, the, the mid 70s. And, you know, you have this relaxation of kind of these, yeah. these, these standards. And so it's not just, in, at that period at least, it's yeah. not just horror movies that start yes. showing lots of gratuitous nudity. All these movies where you're like, there is no point for having a play at all. And, and, uh, and then, uh, boom, I think, nudity. I think the Amity, Amity Hill horror I mentioned earlier, the 2000 and whatever version of it had like, just barely not showing it if that makes any sense like yeah. it's, it's more imaginative to the idea that like the first movie there was and the second movie or the remake it was like shots that were like okay she doesn't have a top on but you don't have to actually show that do you know what I mean like that was the 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 I think that's even more it's the idea of you know showing why some movies show an actual rape scene in a horror movie but don't like you don't have to but, but we'll, if someone gets taken off screen and you hear screaming and all that stuff. You're like, okay, we can use our imagination. We know what's going on. You don't need to show me that. And the same thing with some of these nudity. I'm like, sometimes it's pointless in the idea that you just give us a little bit of glimpse of what's going to happen and we can use our own imagination if we need to or want to. Uh, but yeah, it was kind of funny with Paul and I, with the LCS one, we're like, it just happens. There's so many horror movies out there where there's just, or and actually you mentioned early 70s movies that just have it for because you can i I just don't know <laughs> i think you know and and but and getting back to that argument yeah. that in some sense what you've just raised is the essential philosophical question about horror what do you imply uh yeah. and what do you, show? do you show right how much is uh, to use this very cl- that goes back to the 19th century um uh, do, what is horror right showing and what is terror kind of implying mm-hmm. right and, and where is the balance between that in every movie has to make its own decision and apparently some of them involve nakedness and some of them don't <laughs> some, and, and i don't know like i said and I, it, uh, rules were re- more relaxed like honestly movies that had like swearing and nudity were rated pg in the 1970s yeah. which nowadays would be rated r um and so on and so forth there are certain things that you see um over the chain and just because the rating scale was different then too it was parental sure. guidance and then like it was it like it was like that was it it was just telling you hey pro- parents be be aware of this is a movie not for kids potentially uh, where nowadays there's a lot better scale on that and there's rules and you can't go to a movie unless you're a certain age and all that stuff like that's it makes more sense it's a little safer now I'm not saying it's perfect it's yeah. definitely not perfect um but it's a lot safer it's a little less safe now with streaming and things like that because people say, could just yeah. go on yeah people just yeah. go online and watch it uh, uh now uh with these things but you know i don't know when, are, when it, your kids get a little older and like, we have to hide the remote control to just sort of make sure they don't uh, well i have to hide it now because it just turns the tv on to random stuff so that's like <laughs> we're just going to continue that we're just going to have the remote not be hit not be on you know that's not be visible altogether. but um so your so your research in this book uh we can wrap up here pretty soon is um research in this book it takes you've been watching it's been over a year now you've been doing this like are you watching yeah, movies uh, yeah. probably like a, almost a year and a half now Okay. And so if it comes out sometime, hopefully uh, soon in the near future, um, you must be like moving along. You must be getting some, yes. some chunk of this book done. Yes, that's right. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm well, you know, if this is sort of uh, the history of sort of the horror in America, you know, from sort of the earliest days to now, I'm probably a couple of hundred years in, you know, uh, and maybe I've got the last 40 or 50 years to really sort of nail down. But as a, as a percentage wise, I'm doing, I'm doing all right. That's great. Good. That's fine. Yeah. And you're having fun doing it. I'm, I'm guessing, I mean, this is an uh, enjoyable yeah. experience. Yes. I mean, you know, again, if uh, you had said to me when I was a kid that my day job would be to like read Stephen King and watch movies and sort of write about them, you know, 
what could be what could be bad so it's, it's, i i uh i laughed at my wife i'm like i'm a, I'm a completionist in the idea that i'm a completionist but i'm like i am a check off I'm a, I'm a check off the list and so like i uh, a lot of times if i'm picking a movie to watch i'm like i'm watching the hour and a half movie not the two hour movie because i can maybe watch two one and a half hour movies and where i've only watched one two hour movie or whatever uh and so like it. i'm like i want to go want to consume some stephen king books so i actually googled shortest to longest stephen king books because oh, wow. i was like i want to check a couple off but i know reading like it right now is probably going to take me a lot longer than than reading something like uh, uh what was it cycle of the werewolf uh was like you know i don't know 100 200 pages or something like that whereas uh, it is this massive uh you know book it's it's just kind of funny i'm like reading i'm like stephen king just likes to put words on paper i tell you that <laughs> And, you know, and some, I will say, though, that, uh, you know, it's an interesting thing where some of them, a lot of them are, are worth the trip in history. Oh, yeah. You know? mm-hmm. um, and then there's some of them where you're like, you know, it's 150 pages and it's probably 100 pages too long. But it's, yes. uh, uh, but, but, you know, I mean, I think, I, I not only do I think he's a master of horror, I mean, this is not a shocking opinion. Uh, hot take. But he, Jeremy Dover, hot, hot take. take. <laughs> And I think a slightly warmer take, although not hot at all either. Yes. In, in years, but that he's a much better writer um, yes. than he is often, at least by colleagues of mine, that he is often given credit for. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. That as as a as a as a crafter of fiction, he is also very very good. Mm-hmm. So um, you know, uh, we'll see what happens. Maybe he'll do all right. Maybe he's, maybe he'll do well. He, I think he's got a future in him. Um, yeah. But well, man. it's kind of funny. We yeah. talked about the uh, the movie aspect. You've been watching movies and stuff like that. It's like I forget how many books, how many movies have been based on his books. Honestly, the number oh. of adaptations he has out there. Someone's like, oh, this book was actually ad- ad- adapted into this movie, and I'm like, with a different name or or, or a similar right. name or whatever. And I'm just like, or that was a short story from him, or or so on and so forth. I'm like, oh gosh. And his son is a is is up there too, in my opinion. Joe Hill has an excellent excellent horror uh writing ability oh, yeah. too both both in uh novels and in and in, in comics as well so uh some like you know some of his books are unbelievable a basket full of heads if anyone recommendation for a, for a horror comic is an unbelievable really short comic uh series that you can get and then there's a sequel that wasn't written by him but it's based on the same thing called the refrigerator full of heads uh, oh that's amazing him. yeah uh, and then obviously like nosferatu and, and, and all those things as he's done too uh, right. uh and in the book world and lock and key obviously can't can't not to mention Lock and Key when you say Joe Hill's name, um, but yeah, so it's it's a he, they're they're a, it's a talented person. I have like I said, I'd have not read much and I wanted to read more, and I said, but I needed to check off that I've read more Stephen King books, and so my yeah. thought process was if I were to <laughs> do the shorter books first, that I could check those boxes off and then be happy with it. But uh, no. no, well, yeah. you know, I envy you uh, your first and maybe second readings of some of them, whatever length they are. Yeah. They're, you know, it's a, what a what a great. Project. I mean, some of them I read an audiobook, which is kind of funny. I'm looking at the thing and it's like one and a half days to listen to this. I'm like, holy smokes. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can sit down for a day straight and listen to it. That'd be amazing. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I'm excited to actually read this book. I'm excited to talk uh, again. Maybe we'll have you back on when you it. actually publish it. Uh, and obviously think about us here because we'll be more than willing to read the book, uh, and, and, you know, when it when it comes out for advanced um copy oh, reading we abso- that. i absolutely will get it to you and i promise you it will be shorter than it that i that that much i can tell you the publishers will not allow me uh, well, well it's funny because i had daniel kraus uh, up here uh in, in bangor we brought him in for, i did a beer collaboration with his for whale fall his book that just came out oh yeah sure uh, okay yeah, yeah, so we did a beer we did a beer collaboration highly recommended but um talk about that suspense and eeriness and uneasy feeling a bit but swallowed by a whale is it's, it's fascinating um and he was talking about the many deaths of Zebulon Finch, Life's and Deaths of Zebulon Finch, one of the books he wrote, and it's two novel or two books, and they're both substantial books. And he okay. he's saying in his his uh, you know talk he was doing goes, oh yeah, uh, uh, my publisher made me split it into two books because it actually was one book. And I'm like, oh my god, that book would have been it would have been an encyclopedia. I was like, holy crap, man. He goes, yeah, I, I try not to write that long of books, but uh, it ended up happening. I keep on looking over there because it's over there on the shelf. But um, but yeah, so uh, I'm excited to read it. I'm excited for it to come out. Uh, people are sure. I mean, I'm a big uh, you know Mel Brooks fan, so I should read this uh, Mel Brooks book as well, uh, which you can get wherever books are sold. There's an audiobook version of it. If you are an audiobook or digital uh, version of it, you can buy it anywhere. I always say buy it at your local co- book st- store, but really buy it anywhere. <laughs> Let's be I honest here. Both parts of that statement. Both parts of that statement. <laughs> 
<laughs> if you can get it at your local bookstore, awesome. If you can't, don't not buy it because you can't. Like there are these <laughs> massive online stores that we try not to shop as much on, but they have it available and it still shows the publisher and shows Jeremy here that people like the book and want to read it. So that's, that's, you know, always buy it. Don't, the only thing I'm going to say to people is don't download it illegally. Yes. The only thing I will say is buy it. Try your local bookstore first, but if they don't have it, then obviously. And if you want the audiobook version of it, you have to usually go through someone like uh, a big mega store like uh, Amazon or whatever. But um, but yeah, or, and ask then American your library to, or ask your library to buy it. Right. Yes. Authors are. To, I've never met an author who isn't delighted with having the library buy it and, and, and share it. Right. That's fine, too. But. Please don't pirate it. Yeah, exactly. Yes, and that's the other thing is uh, libraries do have audiobook collections nowadays too, yeah. like online, and so do local bookstores. I know that uh, Briar Patch and, and Bangor here. If you go to their website, you can actually listen to some audiobooks or buy them oh, cool. through the store. So the store gets some sort of kickback on on that oh, as well, which is pretty cool uh, uh, too. But also read American Comics, uh, which is a great book if you're a fan of comic books and the history of comic books, uh, and, and that's available at all your local bookstores and things like that as well. We're looking forward to it. Good luck on your journey in this in this horror field. Hopefully, you don't get too many nightmares. I, I don't know how you do. You sleep okay? <laughs> you know, I under what I'm going to. I know is not, what I'm about to say. I know is not an appropriate biological yeah. metaphor. Um, but you know that boiling the frog, right? So if yeah. you start watching them in chronological order, they're not too scary usually. But we'll see what happens as I go forward. So far, few nightmares, but but we'll few, few nightmares. Yeah, you just watch them with the lights on and things like that. You're fine, you know. So, yeah, that's right, exactly. <laughs> also, I've always said the benefit of a novel and a comic book is that if it gets too scary, you can close it. Trying yeah. to find the remote in a scary moment of a movie is a hard thing to try to figure out turning it off. By the time you're you're too scared, it's already past the scary moment as it is. So. That's exactly. the difference between those mediums as well. But yeah, uh, so good luck on that. And thank you so much for taking time out of your day uh, and, and, and talking to us uh, here at the podcast about horror and all things related. Um, and uh, yeah, I appreciate it uh, so much. My, 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 always, it's great to talk to you. And yes. uh, happy Halloween to you and to everybody. Yes, absolutely. Uh, let's get scary, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thanks, Jeremy. Okay.